Hi, I'm Patricia O'Callaghan, and I'm going to be reading from a great Canadian novel. This is Michael Ondaatje's Coming Through Slaughter, and it's about a musician. And like great musicians and great music, it is a book that is wild, poetic, and daring. And in it, we meet a character by the name of Buddy Bolden, who was a real uh, jazz musician, a cornet player at the beginning of the last century in New Orleans. This is obviously a fictional book about this real person. And Buddy Bolden was a barber during the day and a jazz man at night. So this is a bit of a description of what he was like. What he did too little of was sleep, and what he did too much of was drink. And many interpreted his later crack-up as a morality tale of a talent that had debauched itself. But his life at this time had a fine and precise balance to it with a careful allotment of hours. A barber, publisher of the cricket, a cornet player, good husband and father, and an infamous man about town. When he opened up the shop, he was usually without customers for an hour or so, and if there were any, they were usually spiders with news for the cricket. All the information he was given put unedited into the broadsheet. Then he cut hair till four, then walked home and slept with Nora till eight, the two of them loving each other when they awoke. And after dinner, leaving for the Masonic Hall or the Globe or wherever he was playing, onto the stage. He was the best and the loudest and most loved jazz man of his time, but never professional in the brain. Unconcerned with the crack of the lip he threw out and held immense notes, could reach a force on the first note that attacked the ear. He was obsessed with the magic of air, those smells that turned neuter as they revolved in his lung then spat out in the chosen key. The way the side of his mouth would drag a net of air in and dress it in notes and make it last and last, yearning to leave it up there in the sky like air transformed into cloud. He could see the air, could tell where it was freshest in a room by the color. And so arrived amateur and accidental with the band on the stage of Masonic Hall, bursting into jazz, hurdle after hurdle. A race during which he would stop and talk to the crowd, urging the band to play so loud the music would float down the street, saying, Cornish, come on, put your hands through the window. On into the night and into blue mornings, growing louder, the notes burning through and off everyone and forgotten in the body because they were swallowed by the next one after, and Bolden and Lewis and Cornish and Mumford sending them forward and forth and forth till, as he could see them, their bursts of air were animals fighting in the room. Coming Through Slaughter by Michael and Dachi has a fragmented structure that can be likened to a jazz improvisation. The life of Buddy Bolden, what is known factually about Buddy Bolden, is like the standard that a jazz musician might start with. And then the different directions that Andachi goes in the novel, um, some of them that don't seem to necessarily connect to the main story, are like the riffs, the riffs on that standard. And it's one way of looking at um, in some ways complex structure of coming through slaughter. As a writer and a reader, I always find myself deconstructing a little bit. How does Michael do this? He takes actual factual material and he collages it with imagery from inside his own head to create something that's truer than life, larger than life, more acute than the actual facts that he started with. I'm gonna read you a section now where Buddy Bolden gets married to a woman named Nora, who was a prostitute and then left the profession and they get married and his friend Webb uh, lends them his cottage for a honeymoon. He went to Webb's cottage on Lake Pontchartrain on a bus, his hands dead on his thighs and his body leaning against the window, the wet weather outside and this woman on his right in the dark dress who smiled as she took the seat, scribbling something on paper that she is hunched over, her legs twitching now and then as if her brain is there. He tried to take in the smell of her, the taste of her mouth in the next hotel room as they passed along the road. He knew the shape of her body. As she would stand in front of him, the small breasts cold in the room, the heart of her, 
He went with her for months into the relationship. Awkward first fights, the slow true intimacy, disintegration after they exchanged personalities and mannerisms, the growing tired of each other's speed. All this before they went one more mile. As she wrote on and he thought on into the heart and mind of her, not even glancing at her as she got off alone at Milleberg, for she was an old friendship now, and he could guess the expressions, her face for all the moments. Accidental lust on the bus, carrying her new into his dead brain, so even months later, years later, pieces of her body and character returned. What he wanted was cruel, pure relationship. When you think about, or when I think about Ondaatje, I think this is a guy who created a book that nobody else had ever thought of creating. He's done something with words that has only ever been done in film before. And he's done it with such finesse that you can't help but um, completely applaud it. As a main character, Buddy is um, complex. He's charming and accessible, but he's also in some ways unknowable. And I think that unknowable piece is the piece that we're always wanting to know about what, what does it feel like or what takes a person into madness. So Buddy Bolden was a real person who was a jazz cornet player and very little is documented about him. He was never recorded and he, he went insane. And so Michael Ondaatje, I suppose, is piecing together the life he might have had. And throughout the book, he's slowly starting to lose his mind and he's also a big drinker. So here is a passage that foreshadows that craziness. For a while after that, Frankie Deuce and the trombonist took over some of Bolden's players. They called themselves the Eagle Band. Buck Johnson, 17 years old, took his place. And Bolden arrived at Lincoln Park and saw him playing there, up front center, and just turned around and walked back through the crowd who stepped aside to let him pass. Dude Botley followed him and tells this story, which some believe and which others don't believe at all. He steps out of the park like a rooster, ignoring everybody, everything, and goes up canal. I trail him back to the barber shop. There's wood planks all over the broken glass window and he just rips one out and climbs in. Steps off the ice shelf onto the floor and paces around, his arms out to the side like he's doing a cakewalk. I watch from across the street, and soon he's just sitting there in one of the chairs looking into a mirror. Pretty dark there, not much light. There's light in the back of the shop, and it pours in all over the floor of the shaving parlor, and Bolden is restless as a dog in the chair. He shouldn't be there because he doesn't work there anymore. This is about eight at night, and I'm on the other side of the road shuffling to keep warm because it's cold, and I should be dancing. I can even hear Lincoln Park over the streets. I see him walk to the back of the parlor where the light is and he come back with a bottle in the cornet. He try first to drink, but he begin crying and he put the bottle in the sink. The tears came to my eyes too. I got to thinking of all the men that danced to him and the woman that idolized him and he used to strut up and down the streets. Where are they now, I say to myself. Then I hear Bolden's cornet, very quiet, and I move across the street, closer. There he is, relaxed back in a chair, blowing that silver softly, just above a whisper, and I see he's got the hat over the bell of the horn. Thought I knew his blues before and the hymns at funerals, but what he is playing now is real strange, and I listen careful, for he's playing something that sounds like both. I cannot make out the tune, and then I catch on. He's mixing them up. He's playing the blues and the hymn sadder than the blues, and then the blues sadder than the hymn. That is the first time I ever heard hymns and blues cooked up together. There's about three of us at the window now, and a strange feeling comes over me. I'm sort of scared because I know the Lord doesn't like mixing the devil's music with his music. But I still listen because the music sounds so strange, and I guess I'm hypnotized. When he blows blues, I can see Lincoln Park with all the sinners and whores shaking and belly rubbing and the chicks getting way down and slapping themselves on the cheeks of their behind. Then when he blows the hymn, I'm in my mother's church with everybody humming. The picture keeps changing with the music. 
It sounded like a battle between the good lord and the devil. Something tells me to listen and see who wins. If Bolden stops playing on the hymn, the good lord wins. If he stops on the blues, the devil wins. Andachi's a poet, and when he depicts Bolden's descent into madness, there's a beauty to it. There's a gorgeous poetry to Bolden's madness, which is driven with, sort of intermingled with passion for music. And we all love to fantasize the madness that's inside any kind of creative act. Buddy Bolden is an unrecorded jazz cornetist. Um, in the novel as well, you have a photographer who, there are actual photographs left of E.J. Belloc that we can see, but he defaced the pictures, the faces of the prostitutes that he took pictures of. And the prostitutes themselves are again um, people who are left off the record from that time and place, which is Storyville at the turn of the 20th century. There's a character in this book called E.J. Bullock, who was also a real person. He was a photographer. And some of his pictures still exist, one of Buddy Bolden. And in the book, he and Buddy develop a relationship, Buddy being very extroverted and E.J. Bullock being extremely introverted. And uh, here is a description of Bullock's picture-taking hobby. Look at the pictures. Imagine the misshapen man who moved round the room, his grace as he swiveled round his tripod, the casual shot of the dresser that holds the photograph of the whore's baby that she gave away, the plaster Christ on the wall. Compare Christ's hand, holding the metal spikes to the badly sewn appendix scar of the 30-year-old naked woman he photographed when she returned to the room, unaware that he had already photographed her baby and her dresser and her crucifix and her rug. She now offering grotesque poses for an extra dollar, and Balak, grim and quiet, saying no. Just stand there against the wall. There, that one. No, keep the petticoat on this time. One snap to quickly catch her scorning him, and then waiting, waiting for minutes, so she would become self-conscious towards him and the camera and her status. Embarrassed at just her naked arms and neck, and remembers for the first time in a long while, the roads she imagined she could take as a child. And he photographed that. What you see in his pictures is her mind jumping that far back to when she would dare to imagine the future, parading with love or money on a beautiful anonymous cloth arm, remembering all that as she is photographed by the cripple who is hardly taller than his camera stand. Then he paid her, packed, and she lost all her grace. The picture is just a figure against a wall. And later in the book, here's another description of Balak's and Buddy's relationship. Who was Balak? He was a photographer, pictures that were like windows. He was the first person I met who had absolutely no interest in my music. That sounds vain, don't it? Yep, sounds a bit vain. Well, it's true. You'd play and people would grab you and grab you till you began to, you couldn't help it, believe you were doing something important. And all you were doing was stealing chickens, nailing things to the wall. Every time you stopped playing, you became a lie. So I got so, with Balak, I didn't trust any of that anymore. It was just playing games. We were furnished rooms and Balak was a window looking out. I first read this book 10 years ago when I was touring in Germany. My record label paid for me to go out to Germany and uh, put me up in a little apartment and I was all alone. I didn't know anybody in Hamburg and I did touring and then I would go back to my apartment and that's all I would do. And at one point I became very ill. I got the flu and I had a really high fever and I spent two days in bed reading this book. And it's about a musician who loses his mind. And the way Andace writes, it's so incredibly beautiful and powerful and crazy, but it's so persuasive that he takes you out way far into these places and you go with him. And perhaps because I was feverish and delirious and lonely, I, I totally went out there to all of these places in this book and I actually felt like I was going crazy, just like Buddy Bolden. But it was a good thing. It was a great experience, <laughs> believe it or not.
I think that the moment when um, the narrator of the novel walks onto the stage, you know, walks into the scene, breaks that wall for the reader is um, kind of a startling one. I mean, we're we're in this world of the Storyville, um, Storyville at the turn of the 20th century, and then suddenly we're in the 1970s, and we're with a narrator who quite resembles Michael Andachi, being quite open about how he connects with Buddy Bolden and, and perhaps what his own artistic process is. I think we are meant to see that as Michael Andachi, but no matter what, it's still a narrator, it's still a, a construct, but it is his way of, I think, understanding or maybe um, expurgating his own demons as an artist and, uh, you know, his own urges to destroy um, and his own walk on that line between madness and, and creation. This next passage is almost like an elegy to Buddy Bolden. The sunlight comes down flat and white on Gravier, on Phillip Street, on Liberty. The paint on the wood walls is crumpled under the heat. You can brush it off with your hand. This is where he lived 70 years ago, where his mind on the pinnacle of something collapsed, was arrested, put in the house of D, shipped by train to Baton Rouge, then taken north by cart to a hospital for the insane. The career beginning in this street of the paintless wood to where he gave his brains away, the place of his music is totally silent. There is so little noise that I easily hear the click of my camera as I take fast, bad photographs into the sun, aiming at the barber shop he probably worked in. The street is 15 yards wide. I walk around, watched by three men farther up the street under a Coca-Cola sign. They have not heard of him here. Though one has, for a man came a year ago with a tape recorder and offered him money for information, saying Bolden was a famous musician. The sun has bleached everything, the Coke signs almost pink, the paint that remains the color of old grass, 2 p.m. daylight. There is the complete absence of him. Even his skeleton has softened, disintegrated, and been lost in the water under the earth of Holt Cemetery. When he went mad, he was the same age as I am now. The photograph moves and becomes a mirror. When I read, he stood in front of mirrors and attacked himself. There was the shock of memory, for I had done that, stood, and with a razor blade cut into cheeks and forehead, shaved hair, defiling people we did not wish to be. He comes into the room, kneels in front of the mirror and sits on his heels begins to talk, holds a blade between his first two fingers and cuts high onto the cheek. At first, not having the nerve to cut deeper than scratches. When they eventually go deeper, they look innocent because of the thinness of the blade. This way, he brings his enemy to the surface of the skin, the slow trace of the razor almost painless because the brain's hate is so much, and then turning to his hair, which he removes in lumps. The thin sheaf of information. Why did my senses stop at you? There was the sentence, Buddy Bolden who became a legend when he went berserk in a parade. What was there in that before I knew your nation, your color, your age, that made me push my arm forward and spill it through the front of your mirror and clutch myself? Did not want to pose in your accent, but think in your brain and body and you like a weather bird arcing round in the middle of life to exact opposites and burning your brains out so that from June 5th, 1907 till 1931, you were dropped into amber in the East Louisiana State Hospital. Some saying you went mad trying to play the devil's music and hymns at the same time. And Armstrong telling historians that you went mad by playing too hard and too often, too drunk, too wild, too crazy. The excesses cloud up the page. There was the climax of the parade and then you removed yourself from the 20th century game of fame. The rest of your life a desert of facts. Cut them open and spread them out like garbage. They used to bury dogs on First Street. Holes in the road made that easy. 
While in Holt's cemetery, the high water table conveniently takes the flesh away in six months, and others may be buried in the same place within a year. So for us, you are here, not in Holt's with the plastic flowers in Maxwell House coffee tins or four-inch plastic Christs stuck in cement or crosses so full of names they seem like ledgers of a whole generation. The sun has swallowed up the color of the street. It is a black and white photograph, part of a history book. Five, six of the way through the novel, um, in marches a character who seems to be Michael Ondaatje, who's breaking the wall, this third wall of um, sort of where, where the reader is meant to suspend disbelief, to believe they're participating in the story, and exposes all his research, talks about how he's um, you know, gone to the insane asylum that, that Buddy Bolden ended his life in, and um, shows himself as being this con you know, particularly kind of empathetic character toward Bolden, all things that novelists are told generally not to do. So it's so uncanny that he A, pulls it off, and B, pulls it off in the way that he does. I kept thinking as I, you know, reread this novel that it was almost like the director's cut. You know, the novel ends at page whatever, five, six of the way through, and then there's this extra stuff that you get to see if you bought the extended version, which I just find pretty fun, actually. One of the reasons I like coming through Slaughter is because it's about an unsung hero. It's about someone we would never have known about had Ondaatje not chosen to write about him. And as a musician, I can relate to that because I know so many musicians who are not famous, who will never be known by the rest of the world, not because they're not hugely talented, but because they're not driven enough, they are not business-minded enough, they're not tough enough to survive the very difficult profession. And, uh, and so I love to see the, the unsung hero written about.